to hear my talk. Um, the work I'll be describing was done by um, a group of very talented uh, students and postdocs. Um, you'll see their names and faces pop up as we go through different uh, parts of the talk here. I'll call out especially um, Taraknath here, uh, Mandel, who's um, extremely talented. He's now uh, doing a postdoc um, at Boston University and will be in the market for a faculty position. And he wants to come to India, so just as a heads up to, uh, to you in, in academia. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about four problems. Of, um, last one very briefly, uh, depending on the time. Um, and these are uh, industrially motivated. So one will be on the structure and dynamics of surfactants in my cells uh, for shampoos and body wash. That's the application. I'll be focusing on fundamentals here, not on the applications. Uh, but these are industrially funded. Second one has to do with transport of surfactant to and from uh, interfaces for dispersal of oil spills. Um, and, and you can guess the connection between the sponsor there and the application. Um, and third one is polymer latex particle surface interactions. Um, so all of these are going to involve transport. And the, the theme is going to be um, how you go from molecular dynamics, uh, where all of these problems involve mo the molecular scale. is intrinsic, is important to the problem. But at the same time, there's transport on very long time scales. So you have to bridge from uh, the molecular uh, uh, scale, molecular simulations, all the way to um, long time transport. Uh, and so the way this is done with, is with a variety of tools. Uh, all of these um, will appear uh, in my talk. Um, one set of tools has to do with coarse graining, uh, such as coarse grain molecular dynamics, browning dynamics, uh, which we've also already heard about, and something uh, new here we call population balance uh, browning dynamics that you'll hear about. Um, and the others uh, involved enhanced sampling methods to speed up the simulations and, and to focus on the, the relevant dynamics, not waste your time on uh, uh, fast dynamics that are not relevant to the process. So these involve umbrella sampling. Um, and uh, that's typically coupled with the first passage time analysis that I'll describe, and then something called forward flux sampling. OK, so we'll start with the first problem. I'll talk about the structure first, and then, and then we'll get into the dynamics. Um, so if you're simulating a, a surfactant solution that forms micelles, the first dynamical problem that you would encounter would be uh, for a single surfactant to get out of the micelle, so it can then go into another micelle. And uh, at the atomistic level, uh, you can simulate about as long as you can afford, and this doesn't happen even once. So you're, you're stopped from the get-go. And the reason is that the surfactant molecule is essentially in a free energy well. It prefers to be in the micelle. It's tail here. Um, is um, hydrophobic, so it likes it where it's at. And to get out, it has to climb, uh, diffusively climb this rather steep barrier. So it's going to happen infrequently. So if you track the center of mass of that surfactant molecule relative to the center of mass of the micelle, what you'll see, uh, if my video will let me show it, um, what you'll see is the surfactant rattles around in the bottom of the well, like that. And you can collect the statistics of that and form it into a histogram, which you saw there briefly. And that histogram is related to the shape of this well through the Boltzmann principle. So the logarithm of that histogram is going to, um, is going to tell you the shape of that potential well, uh, but, but only at the bottom. So to determine the shape of that well elsewhere, this particular method involves creating um, uh, bias potentials, which are harmonic potentials that we locate wherever we want, run simultaneous simulations, collect the histograms, uh, take the logarithms of them and then subtract off the biasing potential. So this forces sampling along uh, the entire potential well. And so you can extract the potential well this way by this biasing method. So this is called WAM, or weighted uh, histogram uh, analysis method. Uh, and this is quite successful. So here's uh, an example of two surfactants, one sodium dodecyl uh, sulfate, and the other one is a 12-carbon uh, alkane with an ethoxylated head group. Um, and the height of these uh, potential wells then can be obtained. Um, and from those, we can try to compare those uh, to what we would expect based on experimental data. So in this case, um, uh, one can take the um, logarithm of the critical micelle concentration uh, multiplied by RT. And that should be, according to the theory, that should be the height of this potential well. Uh, and you can see that from the simulations, we get reasonably good agreement with this. 
for the typical micelle size uh, for, these, for these particular surfactants. Uh, so confirming this approach. Now in general, you don't necessarily know the size of the micelle, the aggregation number of the micelle ahead of time. For these, we did. But if you don't know it, um, you have, um, you have uh, we, we can do the same process for micelles of different aggregation number um, and obtain the PMF for each of these. And then we can think about this, um, uh, this process of extracting a surfactant from the micelle as a kind of equilibrium reaction um, of, of, of a micelle size n going to one of size n minus one plus a free surfactant molecule. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can relate that to the um, standard state uh, chemical potentials. Uh, this would be per surfactant molecule, essentially the free energy per surfactant molecule. Um, the, that that uh, reaction then gives us this difference between um, the um, chemical potential, standard state chemical potential of the micelle size n uh, minus that of n minus one and the free surfactant. If we relate that, if we um, take that as an approximation uh, from the PMF, okay, and then the solution is dilute typically, so we can assume ideal mixing to get and get the entropy of the mixing this way. And then from those equations, uh, one gets a relationship between the mole fraction uh, of the micelle size n and that of size n minus one and the mole fraction of the free uh, surfactant. And that's related then to this standard state uh, chemical potential difference up here. Uh, and then uh, um, one, um, um, uh, one can then obtain uh, by recursion the relationship between the n-mer and the one-mer as seen here. The sum of all these is then the total mole fraction. So now we have a relationship that lets us get uh, the entire uh, micelle size distribution then from, from this process of, uh, 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 of obtaining these PMFs, and we can do that for different total concentrations. So you'll see here um, the larger micelles, um, you, you get a gradual increase in the size of the largest or the, of the average micelle um, as we increase the concentration. So this is uh, uh, significant in that to, to get this by direct simulations would be practically impossible. But we can extract this uh, using potential mean force. This particular surfactant is a large one, um, a, a C16 tail and a big ethoxylate group. So this, we didn't know ahead of time what the um, typical micelle size was of this. Now if you, if you have uh, salt added or um, a different uh, surfactant, you can get a growth of long thread-like micelles. Uh, so here, um, the size of the, uh, the length of this micelle is related to what's called the free energy of scission, the free energy cost of breaking a long micelle into two shorter ones. Uh, so the average length will be related again by the Boltzmann principle to this scission free energy, and so will the entire distribution of micelle length. So to extract that length distribution, we would like to know the free energy of breaking, of breaking a micelle. So to, to get that, we use a different reaction coordinate, uh, which is the preferred uh, number of surfactant molecules in some region here that we choose. And then um, we vary this n naught and, and do a weighted histogram analysis. So um, that is shown by this video here. As we change that potential, we're essentially squeezing the micelle. And this can be done reversibly. And in that way, this is, I might call this the uh, Darth Vader force field, but it's a thermodynamic force field. You can squeeze and release and obtain uh, an equilibrium uh, potential mean force for breaking the micelle. So if we do this as a function of salt concentration, uh, and I'll focus here on this black curve, which, for which the salt is, is this organic uh, counter ion, um, actually, for this particular surfactant. You see this very unusual um, non-monotonic uh, dependence of the scission energy that we computed using this method um, as a function of the ratio of the uh, salt um, ion to the, to the surfactant um, uh, molarity. And there's a maximum here at about 0.6. Uh, and this corresponds very well with the maximum in the uh, viscosity measured for, uh, for, such, for such solutions. So uh, the length of the surfact uh, of the micelle uh, will increase exponentially uh, with, with this energy uh, and giving rise to an enormous peak here in viscosity as the micelles become very long at this particular 
uh, value of r. Now, the reason it occurs at this value of r is a detail I won't get into here, but I could discuss with you afterwards. The main point here is we can get a lot of information uh, from, from this method of analysis that will then become important in dynamics. So now we turn to dynamics. The starting point in dynamics is to know the statics. Uh, so um, if we look at then a convection diffusion equation, uh, the, this uh, velocity here could be a migration velocity driven by a potential. So uh, if that's the case, then that uh, convection diffusion equation takes this form here. Um, and you then have essentially escape from a well where the drift velocity will pull you into the well, but you have a diffusive process that can carry you over. And so an interesting question then, an important question for dynamics is then the average time it takes to get over this barrier. If this well um, is um, many, multiple kT in depth, then there's an approximate solution uh, to this equation given by this famous first passage time integral. So now this lets us relate um, the potential here to the dynamics, to the time for these processes to occur. And we can get this for almost arbitrary uh, time durations. So this is a way of bridging from molecular simulations to long time scales. So in particular, for example, if we look at the time for a surfactant molecule to escape a micelle or to come off of a surface, this latter uh, process is important in stability of colloids. How, how well does a surfactant protect um, a colloid molecule against uh, coagulation, um, a, a colloid particle against co coagulation, using the PMFs that we calculated both for this one, which I showed you, and this one, which I didn't, um, we can calculate these escape times um, from the micelle or from the surface for the SDS and for this, this, this other surfactant here. So th these are extremely important in, as I mentioned, in stability of, of um, colloidal, colloidal systems. So now I'm going to go to the next topic, uh, having to do with um, uh, transport of surfactant to interfaces of oil droplets. So this uh, proved to be important in the, this Gulf oil spill, where a, a dispersant, a surfactant, was sprayed over the oil to break up the oil patch to protect the Gulf Coast, and eventually was injected right into the oil column to break up into droplets small enough so that they wouldn't uh, form, form a slick. So an, a, que a question of importance here is how long it takes the surfactant molecule to get to the surface, and then once it's there, how long it stays there. After all, uh, there's a lot of oil in the a lot of water in the Gulf, so one would wonder how long um, you could stabilize oil droplets um, in the presence of the surfactant. So the interesting experiments that were done here uh, were by um, um, uh, Lynn Walker and Shelly Anna and their and their group where they designed this uh, clever experiment involving a tube that contains oil uh, with an interface that's exposed to water that can carry surfactant in. Uh, they can measure the pressure in the oil, which gives them the capillary pressure between that and the water. Uh, and through a microscope, they can measure the radius of curvature of this interface. And between those two measurements, then, putting those together, they can get the interfacial tension as a function of time. And so in their measurements, as they expose, um, as they first introduce the surfactant, it begins to absorb um, to the interface. That causes the interfacial tension to be reduced. And at some point, they switch to water without surfactant. Uh, and this um, decrease in the interfacial tension then is arrested. Uh, they can do this at different time points. And, and they found that only if they uh, loaded up enough surfactant on the interface, um, did they find that when they introduced the water, did the uh, surface tension get, begin to rise again? So at lower loading of surfactant on the interface, um, this absorption was essentially permanent on, the, on this time scale here of 1,000 seconds or so. So very persistent absorption onto the, um, uh, onto the interface up to a certain point. And we wanted to try to understand this and try to understand what controls uh, the uh, desorption, absorption, adsorption and desorption of the surfactant from the interface. Uh, so we'd start with molecular simulations again, atomistic simulations. The surfactant that was used is this monster thing. Uh, it's called Tween 80. It's a commercial surfactant with um, a long, uh, primarily alkane tail, and then a, a PEO um, hydra head, uh, head group here, organized around the sorbitan ring. Um, the waters are shown here. If we make those invisible, uh, 
Uh, you see the tail embedded in the oil and this head group sprawled out over the, over the interface. So to determine how long this would stay on the interface, uh, once again, we need to obtain the potential mean force. And we can do that using WAM, as we did before. Uh, so we get this potential mean force that shows an enormous free energy, around 50 kT, for this to come off the interface. Uh, you'll notice there's hysteresis here. Uh, and this occurs because um, if, we, um, uh, if we're pulling the surfactant off the interface, at some intermediate point, um, there are states in which the tail can be stretched as it tries to retain contact with the, um, with the oil and where it tends to just be shielded by the surrounding head groups. So uh, since, our, uh, since our reaction coordinate here is the center of mass of the surfactant molecule, uh, at these particular locations of the center of mass, uh, there are basically two sets of configurations that are separated from each other by a large barrier. And so if you're pulling out, you sample these states, but not these. And if you're pushing inward, if you're going inward, you sample these, but not these. So you're not equilibrating between the two, and so you don't get a unique thermodynamic uh, potential mean force. So there is a solution to this, uh, which we were able to implement with a coarse-grained version of the surfactant uh, molecule, which is a two-dimensional PMF where we introduce a second reaction coordinate, which is the center mass of the tail. Um, so plotted against those two reaction coordinates, um, we have a contour map of free energy um, that is equilibrated. And if we integrate across uh, one of the reaction coordinates, the y coordinate, the center mass of this tail, um, we get the, the equilibrium um, PMF. So this is an expensive but effective way of, of, of getting a PMF when there's a um, uh, when a single reaction coordinate doesn't allow complete equilibration in the time allowed. So this is one surfactant molecule uh, at an interface. Um, but of course, we're interested in an interface that has an arbitrary amount of surfactant that can be crowded with surfactant. Uh, so to, uh, um, to account for the effect of this, we compute what's called the surface pressure uh, versus the area per molecule. So this surface pressure goes up. As we pack more surfactant on the interface, you see the head groups being pushed up off, off of the interface as this happens. Um, and um, uh, we can compute this easily from molecular dynamics by measuring the uh, pressure um, transverse to the interface and, and the longitudinal pressure, take the difference of those, of those two. Um, and that surface pressure is related to the surface tension in this way. This is the loaded, surfactant loaded uh, interfacial tension, and this is uh, in the absence of surfactant, the, the, the interfacial tension against, uh, against water only. Um, this is the area per surfactant here, which is just the inverse of the surface concentration uh, of surfactant. Um, so we have these two ingredients that we get from direct molecular simulations. One is the PMF for a single surfactant coming off the interface. The other is the pressure area isotherm related to the surface tension. Uh, so these can be put together into an interfacial equilibrium equation where we have a bulk surfactant, which is ideal. It's, a, it's singlet, it's dilute, single surfactant molecules. And it, at the interface, is in equilibrium with what's absorbed, which uh, has these, is given by these terms. First, we have this reference state chemical potential uh, that difference that we get from the PMF directly. Uh, then there's an ideal mixing contribution here and then the non-ideality. Um, and the non-ideality can be obtained by this integral of, this, uh, uh, um, of the pressure area isotherm here relative to the ideal one. And so taking this information here, combining it with the information that we get uh, for the single surfactant, we have this interfacial equilibrium equation. So now we can use that in transport. So the way we do that then is if at some point in time where surfactant is diffusing through a boundary layer to an oil interface, at some point in time we have a concentration gamma at the interface. From that, we can extract by this equilibrium equation the mole fraction of surfactant in the water, not adsorbed, but right at the interface, in equilibrium with the interface. We simply change that mole fraction into concentration units. Uh, then apply a diffusion equation, simple linear diffusion equation, to update this gamma, this surface concentration, and then circle back around, re-update this concentration at the interface in the, in the water, and, and just iterate this. Uh, and so this will let us get the time dependence of the adsorption um, onto the interface. 
And since we know the relationship between the surface concentration and the surface pressure, and therefore the surface tension, um, that gives us the time dependence of the surface tension then. Um, and this uh, will allow us to compare directly to the experiments. So here's, here's our predictions uh, for those experiments um, done at Carnegie Mellon that I showed you. Um, and you see good qualitative agreement. In particular, it predicts this irreversibility, partial ir irreversibility of the adsorption. If you load enough surfactant on, well, here in this region, uh, this uh, free energy difference here is so great, 50 kBT, that it would take a century for this to come off. If you load enough on, you push the head groups off the interface. They're not binding to the interface as they were before. There's not enough room for them. That lowers that free energy, and that shows up in the surface pressure. Um, and then you get partial desorption, but then it, it, it arrests at a certain point, and it would take, we can compute the time, actually, it would take to, to desorb. We can just carry this, this out indefinitely, um, which I think shows the power of this method. We have atomistic simulations that take place over tens or hundreds of nanoseconds, and we can predict the events that are occurring on arbitrary time scales. Okay, so now I'll turn to the polymer latex problem. Um, so um, typical paints that you have, latex paints consist of a binder, which is um, a colloidal particle, about 100 nanometers or so, um, and that, um, that supports the pigments. We're not considering the pigments here. Um, but to get the viscosity curve you want for the various applications, the painting, the stirring, and so forth, um, a polymer uh, rheology modifier is added, which consists of this polyethylene oxide uh, chain capped by alkanes at the end, uh, at the ends. And the alkanes attach um, physically to the latex, the hydrophobic latex particles, creating bridges. And that builds a network that gives you the high viscosity um, uh, that you want um, as the paint is, um, after you've applied the paint, but a low viscosity as you're applying it or as you're, as you're stirring it. So there's great interest in designing uh, these, these thickeners um, uh, for the latex suspension. And again, this involves uh, multiple uh, time scales. So um, we can simulate uh, two particles with the relevant number of polymers, about 100 chains per particle. So these are expensive calculations, but we can carry them out and determine, for example, the number of bridging chains um, between two particles. But we cannot, with the same methods, do an entire network of these and compute the rheology of these things. So we need, again, uh, methods of, of coarse graining. Uh, so one method we've developed is uh, called population balance Brownian dynamics, uh, where we save the time of simulating all of these polymers by simply uh, simulating them as, a, as an equilibrium reaction, where we keep track not of each uh, individual polymer, but of the number of bridges and loops uh, of polymers on each of the particles. So then we have reaction equations. So uh, uh, bridges form by breaking of loops on particle one and par or particle two. Uh, and you lose those bridges when they break and form bridges again on particles one, uh, form loops again on particles one or particle two, as shown here. Uh, so this is the number of bridges between particles I and J, and this would be the number of loops on particle I. So this equilibrium reaction then is what we would solve at every time step. So we're not tracking individual polymers, we're just counting how many bridges exist between two, um, uh, two, two particles and how many loops. And, and then um, we can, uh, what we need to know is these um, constants, the forward constant to form a bridge from a loop and the reverse constant to go back uh, to a loop. Um, so, uh, if we have those, we can do simulations like this, where um, all of the polymers are implicit. We don't track all these internal coordinates of all the polymers. We only track the coordinates of the, of the particles um, and then update the number of bridges as a function of time. And this speeds it up by a factor of 100 or 1,000, depending um, on how many uh, polymers per particle you have. But of course, we have to know what these constants are, forward and reverse constants. So we can try to get those by direct simulation of a little patch of the colloid, where here we have one polymer. It's in a loop configuration. And with a Brownian dynamics simulation and a, a binding potential to the surface, it eventually forms a bridge, as you see here. And if we repeat this, we can uh, start with all loops 
um, and then see the uh, concentration of bridges, fraction of bridges build up as a function of time just by direct simulation. The number of loops goes down. And then repeat this for different gaps. Um, so as, we, as the gap increases, you get fewer bridges that form between the particles. Uh, so this is expensive, but we can obtain this. Um, and then uh, we get these constants here by, uh, we have two constants, the forward and reverse constant. We solve this pair of equations to get this equation for the bridge fraction and then fit the forward and reverse constants to it. And these are the quality of the fits. And from that, we get um, uh, the reverse constant, which is um, bridge to loop. Uh, that's, uh, um, that, um, that rate constant can be rendered as a, as a time. The inverse of that rate is the time for, um, uh, for um, bridge to loop formation. And you see that's about independent of the gap, which makes sense because to go from a bridge to a loop, you just have to break the, the um, contact. You have to break the hydrophobic interaction uh, between the sticker uh, and the particle, and then the chain will just retract back. But the other direction, going forward from a loop to a bridge, requires that you not only break a hydrophobic interaction um, of that loop to the surface, but you have to stretch the chain out to, uh, to reach another particle. Uh, and so as the gap increases, um, you see this time constant, the, the time to form a bridge, gets higher and higher, and eventually beyond what we can simulate directly with this method. So we need an enhancement. We need a way to uh, be able to get to uh, longer, longer times. So one way would be to simply go back to our um, tried and true um, uh, first passage time integral. So if we have a reaction coordinate, for example, a potential for a, um, um, a sticker to come off the wall, so that involves paying a free energy price to come off the wall, and then uh, you have to stretch the chain out for, uh, for that sticker to reach out to the other surface like this. So, uh, so if we want to solve this uh, first passage time calculation, uh, we freeze one sticker to the wall, the other sticker can start at the wall, and then it experiences this um, potential um, in order to reach out to bridge to the other surface. Uh, and so if we carry that out, we can uh, uh, compute the, um, the bridging time, the time to form a bridge, and compare that to what we got from the direct method, the direct simulation method for different gaps. Uh, and we compare that with this ratio. So this is what we compute from our um, first passage time, and this is what we got by our direct simulation. And you see there's agreement to, between the two, meaning the ratio is one. These two are identical, only for the dumbbell. That is one spring. And as you have more springs, you resolve the chain more, you get a buildup of a discrepancy. So the first passage time integral becomes more and more erroneous uh, the more um, springs we put into our uh, chain. And the reason for this is this isn't a one-dimensional, this is a one-dimensional integral. So you have one degree of freedom, which is we take to be the position of this bead. And that assumes that at every position of this bead, all these other variables here, the other beads, are completely equilibrated. They sample all of their configurations. Um, but in fact, uh, that doesn't happen. There's a coupling between these. So um, we really need a multi-mode first passage time where we have all the degrees of freedom here for all the beads. But that would be a hopelessly complicated integral to be able to solve with, with multiple degrees of freedom. We, we had enough trouble with just two. Uh, so we need another way um, that doesn't involve a, um, a potential at all, where we avoid using a potential. And that's a method uh, uh, called the, the um, forward flux sampling method. OK, so the idea here is. Um, we start a, uh, multiple simulations, and um, a sticker would come off a surface and make it to a certain distance, and we simulate for a period of time, and then we harvest all of this, the um, simulations in which the sticker got to a certain distance. We harvest all of those, we throw away the others, and then we start up all of these from this point. Most of them collapse back, some of them make it to the next level, we harvest, we repeat. Of course, this is highly biased. Um, so because of the throwing away of the unsuccessful ones. But we account for the bias because we know what fraction we've picked at each level. So what we get in the end is a flux that we directly compute of chains that make it all the way across. Um, and then we multiply that flux 
by the product of all of these selection probabilities. So the actual flux, the true flux, is less than what we compute directly by the product of all of these selection uh, ratios. And that, that's, that's the forward flux sampling method. Uh, if you have small children, I think of it as if you wanted to know how long it would take randomly running children to go from one end zone of a football field to the other, you could blow a whistle at certain points and take the successful kids and bring the other ones up here and blow the whistle again and then repeat this. And in a finite time, you could figure out how long it would take to randomly make the other, to make it to an arbitrary destination. So if we use this method, um, we find we replicate what we got from the direct Brownian dynamic simulation for these modest gaps, but we can go on now to much higher gaps and much longer time scales uh, with forward flux sampling. All right, so that gives us the ability to um, obtain these uh, reaction equations. I've switched notation here to M and L instead of KR and KF, but it gives us these um, coefficients as a function of gap. And it turns out that there is a multiple mode first passage time calculation, a very complicated one by Lichtman, that roughly agrees with what we compute. Uh, and I, I won't go into that in any more detail here. OK, so what I'll um, end with is a brief description of an even harder problem, which is desorption from surfaces, polymer desorption from surfaces. Um, so uh, if we have a sticker energy um, for each monomer now, it can stick to a surface. With a, with a free energy pr uh, in units of kT, which can be uh, large or small, you get adsorption onto a surface. And here's the number of monomers we have. Um, we want to know how long it would take this to come off. So this might be important in protecting, say, stents in, a, in, a, in, the, in the human body that have a, a polymer coating on them. And you want to know how long the co polymer coating will stay on over the time scale of years, let's say. What is, it, what is the desorption time for these as a function of the length of the chain and the strength of the attraction? So this is ready-made for forward flux sampling. Uh, it's, it's, there's no single simple reaction coordinate for this that will work because there's so many um, trap states. There's so many states here um, uh, that can be trapped. Here's a couple of examples of, um, of uh, simulations for relatively weak uh, stickers and uh, stronger stickers. And again, we use forward flux sampling to accelerate, um, accelerate the, these simulations. Turns out we need uh, to use two reaction coordinates. One is the distance um, of the center mass of the chain from the surface. But that's not adequate um, uh, because it, you could pull out part of the chain a long way and still have many, many contacts. So we also need to keep track of the number of contacts of the polymer chain with the surface. This is the, the adsorption process. Um, and using these two, it's possible to build a first passage, uh, sorry, a, um, a forward flux sampling um, scheme um, to do predictions. And we get kind of mind-blowing predictions here for different um, uh, sticker strengths. As you see, we can do arbitrary sticker strengths, arbitrary chain lengths, um, as you see here. And we can uh, get t times longer than, than you really need to compute, I would say. Um, and look at the effects of, for example, the strength of the inner. By the way, this is kind of an interesting plot that we don't understand because uh, a slope of 1 here would mean an exponential dependence on the total strength, which is sort of what you'd expect from a Boltzmann-type process. Uh, this is uh, n is the number of monomers. This is the attachment strength per monomer. So you might expect the time to be exponential in this, and it's not quite. It's some kind of fractional exponential. Uh, and you can see other interesting changes as you change the sticker strength here and make it weaker. And so the time rather, can rather quickly get to be much more modest uh, if you reduce this uh, sticker strength. Uh, and here's different, uh, different kinds of polymer molecules. I, what I showed you was a freely jointed chain, but you can also put in excluded volume. Um, you can put in bending potentials and, and, and so forth. And you see some fairly profound effects on the, on the desorption. So this is a problem that's generally not been solved in the polymer field, maybe in some, to some extent doesn't need to be solved. If you, once you get above the age of the universe, you probably don't need to be solving dynamics anymore. Um, uh, but there are cases where this will be a, a be relevant um, simulation. OK, so I'll, I'll summarize here and let you get to your dinner. Uh, so we use the weighted histogram method and forward flux sampling. I didn't talk about metadynamics here. And they, they allow us to steer molecular uh, dynamic simulations through otherwise impossibly slow transitions. Um, and they can give us, uh, some of them can give us free energy changes and transition rates. 
uh, we've applied to uh, surfactant, uh, micelle free energy, surfactant desorption, um, and uh, polymer loop to bridge transitions. Um, uh, and we've also captured these, um, sorry, I'm not very handy with this. Um, we've also captured loop to bridge transitions um, via fast hybrid population balance Brownian dynamics method. And this method we hope to use for doing shearing flows. So once we have this method, we can, one could put in HI, for example, do Stokes and dynamics, and depending on as long as this reaction step is relatively fast compared to the, all the matrix manipulations you need to do, it may add very little overhead. So you could fairly quickly go from, um, you know, to, to put in full HI and do pretty complicated problems where there are these polymers bridging all the chains together and where they can change dynamically as a function of configuration. Uh, and um, right, and then there's forward flux sampling, which allows us to address the problem of polymer desorption from surfaces, which by the way, we searched the literature very carefully. There's very little uh, theoretical work on desorption of polymers um, from surfaces. There are, there are brushes, there are end tethered and so forth, but not, um, not simple adsorbed polymers on the surfaces. Thank you for your attention. We have time for some questions. Perhaps I can start off with sure. a question. People um, are. Yep. So in the first part of your talk, where you compared um, your calculated um, standard for energy of transfer uh, of SDS in, in yeah. and out of a micelle, and you compared it to experimental CMC values. So I guess in both parts, um, you've got complicated um, electrostatic interactions and counter ion effects. And so I was wondering how you're treating them on both sides of that equation. Um, yeah, in, well, of course, in the simulations, the simulations were done with all of that in, included because all the salt ions were there, so all the electrostatics were there. So it was done at high salt concentration, or? Uh, I, think, I think the SDS, I think we did with, we had only the, I believe we had only the counter ions to the surfactant, but of course it's a fairly small box. So there, there were, there were, there was electrostatic screening. Um, in the case of the uh, one of the systems, the, the thread-like micelle, there was um, added sodium salicylate, uh, which was a, a, a salt, right. an organic salt. Right. So all of that's in the um, in the MD simulations. Uh, are you worried about the, the the validity of the of the free energy expression for? using the standard state chemical potentials and the... Uh... Well, I'm thinking about this, um, the CMC, so to interpret the CMC in terms of a standard free, free energy of transfer, you have to make assumptions about counter ion condensation. Um, uh, well, there would be. So there are, we do see that the sodium ions, we see from MD, the sodium ions do bind uh, to the um, head groups of the surfactant micelle. In fact, we did quite a study on that to, because the force fields, very sensitive to the force fields actually, yeah. and if you don't get that right, you actually get the wrong, you can get the wrong shape of the micelle if it's an elongated micelle. So it's in the MD simulations. So our approach is to assume that that's, that all those details are captured properly and that um, when we go to the next scale, which is just to consider these micelles and the surfactants as free species, um, that we've adequately accounted for for all the details of the uh, electrostatics and the other um, uh, and the other physical chemical effects. Okay, that's the idea. All right. Okay. Good. Can you go back to the the um, slide where you put the um, sampling rate into the BD simulations, where you actually implemented the um, you know, the, the, you had the one simulations where you had the one chain that was sampling the wall, and then you got a lot of statistics for that, and then you talked about putting that into BD. Um, so you're talking about part. the um, latex problem, like this right, stuff right around here? here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This slide? Yeah, and so then you got these good statistics, and then I think it was the next slide. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing this becoming a potential. This one? Yeah, so you, you've got these, these details of the formation rates, the adsorption rates, and desorption rates, and I'm picturing this being a, a durability of a bond relative to Brownian motion. Um, well, it has, um, 
there's, there's Brownian motion in here as well right. as the uh, sticker strength. So I'm thinking on the time scale of like, I, I haven't put it all together yet. So what was the next slide after this one? So, so at this point, we're trying to, sorry, um, where am I here? At this point, um, at this point, what we're doing is uh, trying to construct a potential mean force for a sticker. Um, one sticker is remaining on the surface. The other sticker pops off the surface, paying this price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. as it goes to the other surface, it has to stretch. And this is the chain stretching free energy here. Uh, the farther you go, the more it stretches. And this gives us, a pot we think, a potential of mean force um, that would allow a first passage time integral. And this failed, as I mentioned, because there's not just a single, um, uh, a single reaction coordinate. There's yeah, yeah. all the internal beads mm -hmm. of the chain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which made this, um, made this method fail. And this is where you went to the next step with the kids running across the field and so on, right? This is where we went to fast, uh, to forward flux sampling, yeah. um, where we don't need a potential. Uh, forward flux sampling doesn't need a potential. A potential mm -hmm. in general would, pretend, would, would um, depend on many coordinates. So a, a single, um, um, a, an integral like this de depends on your having one, um, one uh, reaction coordinate, mm -hmm. um, z, the distance from, from the surface that determines a free energy, and then you just have this barrier that you're diffusing out of. Mm -hmm. But if you have many, for example, the polymer on the surface, absorbed to the surface, it has all these internal states. <laughs> um, and so there's not a single potential. The potential would depend on the positions of all the, right. all the beads and all the absorption states, everything. You can't just turn it into center mass and say the potential depends on the center mass because you can have the whole polymer could be sitting above the surface with nothing attached. Or it, you could have most of the monomers stuck and a few of them stretched out. So there, there's not a single um, reaction coordinate that captures the interactions. So, okay, okay. Okay, there was a question here. Fantastic. I mean, I think this is one of the, one of the uh, work which has used uh, molecular simulations to the uh, the best use. Uh, particularly the free energy methods, uh, fantastic uh, work. I have two questions. Uh, one is related to this Martini force field which you have used. Uh -huh. uh, can you describe a bit more, because uh, as we were discussing, this, this has many uh, artifacts, particularly when you make use of uh, salt and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So how did you uh, uh, modify that? And the second question is uh, for the sake of uh, other users, uh, because now you have used uh, forward uh, flux sampling, which essentially is extremely time-consuming uh, uh -huh. you know, method. Uh, can you just give an idea of uh, how the well-tempered uh, method uh, work against uh, FF, you know, FSS method? And is, uh, you know, when does the, you'd recommend to use uh, uh, the forward-first uh, sampling compared to the well-tempered method here? Oh, well-tempered metadynamics against yeah, FFS? Metadynamics, yeah. yeah, I haven't used um, well-tempered metadynamics very much. So I can't compare directly. Um, we, we did use it for a problem of crystallization. For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, well-tempered metadynamics, what that is is you imagine you have a free energy surface and it has many local minima. So if you just try to simulate on that, you fall into a local minimum and you get stuck. So crystallization would be a typical problem. And so what do you do about that? So what, what that method does is it basically, think of it as taking sand. They're, they're, they're actually a little Gaussian. Uh, potentials, so it's always a potential biasing method. So you go in and wherever you're sitting, on the, you, have, you have a couple coordinates. You, you define some coarse grain coordinates, and you find you're sitting in one spot, and you start putting these Gaussian peaks in there, like pouring sand into the potential well. And what happens is you pour more and more sand in, your particle gets pushed up until it gets kicked out of the well it's sitting in, and it goes somewhere else. And wherever it goes, you pour the sand in again. And then finally, it's explored everywhere, and then what you do is you take your sand and you basically tip that upside down and that's your, now that's your potential surface. So it gives you the potential surface and tells you where the minimum is, it tells you where all the traps are and so forth. And that method has been used um, yeah, as so, well. So, so, so just, just education uh, about that method. We, we didn't use it in this case uh, because we weren't looking for a free energy surface at all. We were just looking for a flux. 
Yeah, but both the methods that requires you one need, you know, one requires the reaction coordinates, right? You need to know yeah, you do, from you, A to B, so you need yeah. to know what yeah, is Yeah, forward flux sampling requires also a coordinate. You just don't need to compute a free energy. Right. Um, so you don't need, um, um, uh, yeah, but you do need a coordinate, and there are artifacts. These methods, I don't mean, mean to, to make it seem that these are easy to use. There are all sorts of ways of going horribly wrong with these methods, including FFS. Uh, we're struggling with one right now, so, um, yeah.